please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Mickey McManus. Good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you about what happens when things and places wake up, the sort of changing nature of things. And I've been thinking about this, and it's sort of um, a sequel to a, a book I co-authored a few years ago called Trillions, which was really about this idea, it was sort of a field guide for an era of connected complexity. What happens when we're in a sea of information devices, may, maybe saturated with trillions of things? And when we started writing that book, the story really started with our climb up the sort of current mountain of complexity and computation. This, this amazing power that we built over the 20th century. And if you think about it, we've come a long way. We, we you know, did the fax machine in the 1920s, and the thing that's powering most of the Android phones by the 19, 1969 Unix or 1972. So we've climbed this amazing mountain of complexity, and when we got to the top, we can do wonders. I mean, if you think about it today, we should be pretty proud of humankind. You can swipe your finger across a piece of glass and talk to somebody on the other side of the planet. You can type 140 40 or 100 and so characters and actually foment a revolution. It's kind of, you know, yay team, we've done it. You know, this is not bad, right? <laughs> and we've done a lot of work to get here. If you think about this, we have six to eight billion supercomputers in our pockets. That's more than people on the planet. You know, and so, so this is pretty exciting. But the thing is, you climb a mountain sometimes and you get to the peak and you realize that was not the peak. It turns out there's a really big mountain ahead and that's trillions, not billions. And it's coming within the next five years. This really is a sea of information devices. And frankly, this is a done deal. This is already happening. Um, in 2010, we actually made 10 billion microprocessors in one year alone. We actually made more transistors than grains of rice, and we made them cheaper. This is already happening. This is a new world. And today, information's in the computer, and, and this super saturated solution, we look into our phone and we see our apps, and we look under our desktop and we see our folders and different things. But really what's going to happen is this super saturated solution of computing is going to have this seed called connectivity. And when connectivity hits it, it's going to turn the sock inside out. And suddenly we're going to be living in a sea of information devices. Really, it's going to be you, me, our, our products, our places, our communities living in the information. This is really like turning the sock inside out. And it's coming faster than we think. And the thing is, it's not a trillion one-dollar bills. It's not a trillion of the same thing. It's a trillion things sending a billion messages. It's a trillion things having you know, a bad update and turning into a brick. It's a trillion things with malicious intent. I'm looking at you, Volkswagen. I don't know <laughs> what you're thinking. <laughs> OK, so, so this is a world that I think the history books are going to call an era of unbounded, malignant complexity. That's where your kids are going to grow up. <laughs> and it's coming fast. And while we're fighting over the last few inches of the current information age, you know, MySpace has to die for Facebook to win, it turns out that the surface area of trillions is really big. Anything multiplied by a trillion turns out to be an interesting number. So entire industries will collapse and others will be formed overnight. This is a big deal. And if we thought we saw something, we haven't seen anything yet. I would say there are a lot of business opportunities ahead, but I also think a lot of opportunities for society to sort of resynchronize with the sort of ecology of the natural world as well. McKinsey recently put out a report uh, about two months ago that basically said the so-called Internet of Things, just the part of trillions that we're talking about today, will represent something on the order of three to eleven trillion dollars of contribution to the to the worldwide economy every year by 2025. This is going to have major impacts. I'm going to Carl, name check Carl Sagan, too, because what the heck, right? He was incredibly quotable. And the reality is, you know, he said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, first, you're going to have to invent the entire universe. And, and what I, I say that because I think it, this is going to require entirely new invention, entirely new thinking, and a new mindset for all of us. We will not be able to use the tools that we built over the last, last hundred, few centuries, hundred years, et cetera, to actually solve these problems. We've got to change our mindset. So I wanted to share with you a little experiment I did. It was just sort of a fun way that I was trying to find out what it would feel like. And what we could do, 
um, to change my mindset and my team's mindset about what was possible. So I teamed up, and this is just fun, it's maybe not as sweet as an apple pie, um, but we teamed up with Oreo cookies, and we teamed up with Twitter, and we said, let's do a six-week experiment with 10,000 of the snarkiest people on the planet <laughs> and try to see what would happen if whatever was trending on Twitter, trending now, could be vended now in a micro factory. I'll show a video. South by Southwest Interactive in Austin, Texas. We invited festival goers to the Trending Vending Lounge to participate in an experiment. What would happen if your Oreo cookie joins the social network? Our prototype vending machines take what's trending on Twitter and turns those trends into custom Oreos. Using unique transparent touch screens, users scroll through a list of trending topics, each related to a particular flavor combination and pattern. Advanced algorithms translate the tweets into custom cookies. In all, there are about 10,000 possible combinations. Users can also mash up two trends to further customize the experience. The resulting cookie combines elements of the two original trends. Once the user hits Make Cookie, the real magic happens. Using some repurposed 3D printing technology and a pneumatic pump system, we've enabled festival attendees to watch their custom cookie as it's robotically printed and assembled. cookie is dropped into a cup, vended, and is now ready to enjoy. <laughs> so I'm going to stop it there. It's just a little fun. I mean, what was really neat about that, and it was a six-week project, just a little experiment. Um, what was really neat was it was daylight savings time that weekend, and the cookies actually started coming out as starbursts of orange and lemon. And, and it was just this fascinating kind of experiment. And what would happen if we, if we, could, if we could literally use the connectivity of everything to, to build something? But I think the secret to this, what was really exciting and has led to some really interesting new business and new revenue and new, new exciting kind of innovation, is that we said in the 20th century, we basically, we basically had to lower the cost of calories. And a few companies did that so that we could feed the world. But we didn't make a distinction between good and bad calories. We basically also increased and the rate of diabetes and increase the rate of obesity. So if you think about this, we broke this natural feedback loop with nature because we lowered the cost of calories so much. And so what we ended up doing in this is we came up with a quantified snack markup language. It was kind of a silly experiment in saying, what would happen if you work out really hard and your Fitbit says, I worked out really hard, give me something a little sweeter. And maybe if it also says, I didn't work out this week, it basically you know, volumetrically increases the size of it so you feel full but gives you less calories. Right, reconnecting that feedback loop again. So what would happen if we could actually start doing this at a massive scale? So as I was doing this experiment, it turned out we weren't just talking about the Internet of Things and trillions, we were also talking about a change in digital manufacturing, and we were using machine learning. So I, I saw it wasn't a sea of information devices at all. It was more like a primordial soup. And these big megatrends, the Internet of Things, machine learning, and digital fabrication were all slamming into each other. And these are inevitable trends. They're coming. And my question became, what happens when things wake up? What happens and how do we design for ecologies, for communities of things? So I'd like to introduce you to Project Primordial. And I think it's best if we just dive into the soup. So we know a little bit about Internet of Things. In fact, we heard some great stories about what was happening in that space earlier today. Um, some friends of mine started a company, and they said, what if all the media pouring off your body could be captured. All this exhaust data pouring on the ground and creating sort of industrial waste of information that nobody could use. They called the company Body Media. These are the like sort of grandfathers of wearables and the gold standard today. And what they did is they took 10,000 or tens of thousands of pounds and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical equipment. They tested a whole bunch of people and they came up with six sensors for maybe a hundred bucks. And they basically replaced mass with math. 
They added some algorithms. They had it tested with hundreds of thousands of people, got FDA approval that it actually helps people lose weight. And what they said is, what if we could actually use all this media to create the owner's manual for the human body and discover that? We heard earlier about the, the, the Proteus stuff. You know, this is kind of amazing because it's copper and magnesium and other stuff your body needs. And it's using the acid in your stomach to generate a power pulse that, that sends a wireless signal to the Band-Aid, right? But what's exciting about this and interesting about this is they'll probably have more servers in the pharmaceutical industry than Cisco will. This is the Internet of Things inside of us. This is, this is hundreds of billions of things alone every year. So when we talk about digital manufacturing, I think a lot of people have seen you know, 3D printing and things like that. Um, this, is a, this is a fundamental phase change as well, another megatrend. And if you look at it, we can actually rip atoms into bits. This is something called reality capture. Just the same way we used to be able to rip CDs and make our own playlists. An artist named Joris Larman in the Netherlands is dreaming about a day when we can actually 3D print large structures. So what happens if you can just basically maybe set two robots on the brink of a, of a canal in Amsterdam and push the on button, and then come back a little later and actually have a bridge that the robots built and walked over as they built it? This is real. <clears throat> we can also 3D print basically a million strands of DNA a day. Last year, uh, Cape Canaveral launched an interesting 3D printer. It was the first time humankind ever manufactured off-planet. This is a group called Made in Space. And they basically proved it by emailing a wrench to the, to the mission commander. Think about that. <laughs> now, it's about this time in the talk I usually like to talk about Barbie. <laughs> so um, let's get into it. All right, so Barbie is, I mean, I think all industries are going to be affected by this in some way. Um, let's pick something kind of silly, toys and things like that. You know, it's about a $2 billion industry, and there are about 200 grams of plastic in a Barbie. And you can fit about 15,000 of those Barbies in a shipping container. But you can actually fit the equivalent of 250,000 Barbies if you just set, send the, the plastic alone. So think about what that means from an environmental standpoint if we can really start to manufacture and build things locally. Now, what happens when these two trends slam together? Internet of Things, Digital Fab. Here's one. As it's printing, it stops and occasionally says things like, hey, could you put in that circuit board? Um, do you mind if you put in a battery now, right about now, maybe a, an LED, maybe a motor? Hey, I think I'm just about done. Go grab your remote control. Let's take off. That's two of the trends coming together. So let's talk about machine learning, the third of these three big mega trends. OK. Um, what if we could scrape with machine learning all the things that civilization has ever built, every piece of geometry, every place, everything, and create the social network of things? You know, this gasket goes along with this cotter pin and with this bracket. This gear goes with that gear. That's how they get together. What if we could basically create autocomplete for the physical world? What if we could give our next generation of kids the power of 10,000 engineers at everyone's fingertips? This is also already happening now. And it's not just design. We talk about self-driving cars. I wonder sometimes if the self-driving cars have what neuroscientists call mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are this sort of theory that I mirror behavior. You know, you, uh, I try to figure out how, where I end and you begin. Maybe I mirror behavior so I can learn. Maybe I mirror it so that I actually have empathy. I think these cars have that. They have to actually figure out if Johnny's going to run into the street. They actually have to figure out, should they hit the school bus full of children or take me and the car off a cliff? These are real things. You know, if you think about it, whatever's in a self-driving car today is in your shoes tomorrow. That's Moore's Law. So machine learning is coming everywhere. This is a neural processing unit where you do not write any code. You basically reward it for good behavior like your kids. I like that white square. Please go follow that white square. So, so are we going to start raising products? So I think, I think the way to think about this is um, in the 20th century, we built these sort of static equilibriums. Think of them as a, 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 like, a, like a pendulum. You know, you build your factory, you build your supply chain, you don't screw with it, right? You don't want to mess it up because it's really complicated, and it's a static equilibrium, and you deliver it. And then you create this thing called Mad Men and advertising to convince people to like the things you made, because you can't really change that very easily. And it's just like the dove's wing in nature. They, they sort of just glide. It's a static equilibrium. It's incredibly energy efficient. But when a hawk comes along, suddenly it flips up and becomes a dynamic equilibrium. It flaps away. So this is a dynamic equilibrium, and nature found a way to actually do trade-offs between static and dynamic. And that was like a big deal. That was the sort of primordial soup moment. 
And what's exciting to me about this is that I think we actually have all the pieces in place for the first time in human history. So think about this for a second. This is the primordial soup. I've got sensors and I've got a feedback loop. That's the Internet of Things. Uh-oh, I'm really bad at this. I wonder if I could get better. I've also got the ability to actually move. I can use robotics, I can 3D print things, I can actually change what I made. And I've got the ability to learn and get better. So we have all the pieces to basically, for the first time in the world, do this dynamic trade-off. And what I think is going to happen is we're going to have to start designing for loss of control. We're going to have to start designing for this ecology of things and co-creating with everybody else. I think this is an exciting time, but it's a scary time as well. The good news is nature can give us some guides. It's been running for about three billion years and figuring this stuff out. And so nature can tell us about how it, what it takes to build a carbon cycle, in this case, maybe an information carbon cycle. We know there are life forms and currencies and architectures and environments. We also know that ecologies and economies, at least healthy ones, always live on the edge of chaos. And frankly, they always have the freedom for independent agents to exploit underused resources. Think of that. In some ways, that's basically this idea that you know, uh, one organism's waste is another organism's food. That's just that exhaust data pouring off body media. And finally, it needs liquidity to grow and flow. So think about this. Another part of that report said that 40% of the value in the next 20 years is actually going to come from playing well together with others. We're going to have to be a part of that carbon cycle, part of that information cycle, and be part of the flow. So I'll leave you with this question. How do we get that stuff to fade into the woodwork? How do we put people first? And how do we shape a world that's going from dumb materials, plastic and aluminums, to computronium? How do we shape a world of networked matter? Thank you.